Douglas Kent has spent over 30 years as a leading supply chain practitioner, advisor and educator and is currently the managing partner for Chainovation based in California. Douglas is a frequent lecturer and author of many supply chain articles and speaks frequently to audiences worldwide, sharing his passion and decades of experience. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Douglas Kent. Thank you. I wish they hadn't referenced the three decades and all of that in the opening, but uh, it just makes me feel a little bit old. Um, good afternoon. I guess I am more or less between you and maybe one other presentation, or, or for some of you, in particular you, um, a glass of wine. So um, thanks for joining. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, a brand new certification, um, the first of its kind in the world. Um, and the first corporate certification ever to be developed by either Apex or now ASCM. So um, let me tell you a little bit about how this, this came to be. So it was about 18 months ago, uh, the board of directors of Apex had been talking for quite a long time about the opportunity to extend their right to win in the marketplace relative to certifications, extending that certification possibility from the individual to the organization thus the enterprise-wide certification. And what we found was, uh, through doing a number of voice of the customer inputs, was that most organizations had a lot of aspiration around managing a supply chain, not only to meet the economic stakeholder, but also to demonstrate to the market and to their own stakeholders, and even to consumers, that they can manage a supply chain, not only giving back economically, but also in a responsible way in terms of ecological and ethical supply chains as well. And what the voice of the customer input also showed us was that although aspirationally organizations from the board level and the C-suite down had a, a, a strong desire to be able to demonstrate this, putting it into an operationalized fashion deep within the supply chain, and across the processes of plan, source, make, deliver, return, we sat at a level of aspiration, but the inability to set some standards and ability to be able to drive that down directly into the supply chain. So I won't go through all the different inputs, but you can see here that there was definitely a perceived level of a gap. Um, and we looked at the other certifications that actually exist in the marketplace, which I'll talk about as well, and we saw a couple key differences. One is oftentimes they focused on one of the verticals, Dow Jones Sustainability Index, focusing on the sustainability side, or other global compact, stressing uh, aspects of eth ethical dimension as well but not any of the certifications that seem to be in the market actually focused on the holistic nature of all three dimensions and were supply chain specific. So it seemed to be that given the reputation that ASM had in the marketplace relative to certification, and certainly it focused on the individual, we had the right to win in this space. So then came the challenge. So we took the idea, the voice of the customer input back to the board of directors and we said, we think we can do something here. We can do something like we had done years before when we initially, back in 1997, developed the SCORE model, is we could harness the network of volunteers and the experience that existed there, and we could pull from a lot of the goodness that was created in other certifications, and we could develop a set of standards. So the board came back and said, sounds like a great idea, um, and we'd like to launch into this design team, and we started that design team project in March of 2018, and they said the only thing is, yeah, we'd really like to do this, um, but um, we'd like you to do it in six months. Yeah. Um, thank you, Abe. Um, so, uh, so we launched the network of participants choosing um, an invite-in sort of methodology and brought different companies together representing different industries, geographies, etc that often entered, that entered into their participation from different objectives as well. So let me talk about a few of those. So Siva Logistics, for example, 3PL company, very much interested in achieving the certification or participating in the development of a certification, 
because they saw it as a true differentiator in the market. So if you're gonna outsource your logistics, and maybe you weren't meeting the standards that you desired or aspirationally had in terms of meeting all three dimensions, it might be nice if you could partner with somebody or choose an outsource provider that could demonstrate that. Others, Boeing, for example, very much interested in being able to demonstrate to the market, probably even more so now than before, um, that they're running a responsible supply chain. Petrobras, the Brazilian oil and gas company, had a little ethical issue a few years ago, nearly brought down the Brazilian economy, the former two presidents currently sitting in prison. So each of the companies coming into the participation list of developing this new set of standards perhaps had a slightly different motivation. And as we start to share this information out into the market, we see that that's the case for a lot of people. That in essence, the same moving an aspiration into an operation, that was clearly there, but the motivation factor could be a little bit different from, from, for some than, than others. We put together uh, the participation team. We started to look at comparative frameworks. And again, what we saw was that nothing seemed to be holistic or supply chain specific. So we, we wanted to try and first figure out what would a framework around these three dimensions actually look like? And which of those potential existing certification models might give us the best example of what we wanted to create? And we had a couple things definitely in mind. We wanted to start first to make sure that you had a strategy, right, from the very beginning, and that at the end of the day that that strategy manifested itself into some degree of operationalization that produced results. So in looking at all the different uh, potentials that were out there, the other thing that we saw was that in all the other certifications that existed, when we started to look for content to build out our standards, one thing was for sure, is that we didn't have to create a lot of net new. There was so much goodness that already existed. Whether that was a, the part of the UN Global Compact, which ASCM is a signatory on, or GRI, or what existed in ISO, or what existed in Baldridge, et cetera. There was so much goodness that was out there that all we had to do was figure out a way in which we could put all of that goodness together and put it in a framework that people could understand and be respectful to the three dimensions that we initially had in mind, keeping that triple bottom line as, a, as the forefront. So we looked at the, the, the comparative frameworks that were out there, and the one that, that from a structural standpoint was the closest to what we thought we wanted to develop, it was Malcolm Baldridge, because it did have a lot of the key dimensions that we wanted. It talked about customer centricity, it started with strategy, it talked about governance, there was a workforce element, it all seemed to be very good. So we started the idea with structuring somewhat around the Malcolm Baldridge. We, however, did like a lot of the framework examples that are coming from ISO in terms of it's a three-year certification, there's an examination which is done, it's both a desktop review and a live visits to certain sites. So there's a lot of goodness with respect to that. So I'd say if you had to take a look at the way we structured the certification, it kind of took the best of both of those, right? And a lot of content from the other frameworks. In addition to that, the other great thing is we already had such a wide body of knowledge that existed inside of ASCM already from the individual certifications. So clearly pulling from certifications such as CSCP and CPIM, et cetera, even principles on demand, those, the body of knowledge that existed there, we were already certifying people on the goodness of what we thought was the strength of managing a supply chain at the individual level. Could we not bring that back up to the enterprise level and use some of that? In addition, of course, SCORE, had a huge body of knowledge relative to the goodness and best practices that we really hit upon and could draw from and leverage into the new model as well. So certainly SCORE as a body of knowledge provided a, a great deal of input as well. So literally the teams went through all of the learning systems for all the individual certifications, including from SCORE, and we put together our first draft of that, and then we started to put that into test. So the structure of the document looks something like this. I won't hit on the details, but what you need to understand is in addition to um, the breakdown of the three dimensions, one thing we certainly played on was that we wanted the standards to be very clear. So it's completely, and by the way, just in case I didn't mention it, 
you're the first audience in the world to actually ever hear about this, right? Other than our initial launch. And the great thing about it is I can't think of a better market to put this into play. So super excited. We presented it this weekend at the Executive Summit with some great reviews, particularly around aspirations of how to leverage this into public health in Africa, et cetera. And it's just so exciting to think about the leverage that we could have with this model. But we set forth, a, 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 the standards were the first thing. So we put together the standards, and those are, those are what, in essence, a company gets graded upon, if you will, or that's how a company gets evaluated. But in addition to that, what we wanted to do was also to provide some evidence pieces. So if you were trying to give evidence that you're meeting a standard, let's say you already had an ISO 9001 or a 14001 or 28000 or you had this other certification, then we believe that some of that information could be used as evidence pieces to demonstrate that you've met the standards that we've set forth. So in addition to the standards, the evidence pieces are also completely transparent. And we also put together questions that an examiner or an evaluator might ask you in order to bring proof points of that evidence coming forward. So all of that information doesn't sit in some isolated examiner's secret box, right? It's all completely transparent to any organization that wants to proceed to try and get the certification. The other great thing about that is, of course, not only being completely transparent, but companies can then do themselves a degree of readiness check to even see whether or not they think they're up to pursuing the standards even before they have to go for a registration. So again, making that completely transparent. And that was the goal. So when we put together the structure of the model, this is in essence what we ended up with. Of course, starting with the triple bottom line three dimensions, uh, obviously looking at the ethical dimension, the ecological dimension, the economic dimension, all three. But as you see here in the center, we really focused on, again, because it's supply chain specific, what are the results that are created in the way in which we manage our supply chain that respects the three dimensions? So across plan, across source, across make, across deliver, across return. So if some of you attended a few sessions today, you heard things like circular economy, which would relate to managing across multiple dimensions in the area of reverse logistics or return, right? Um, th things as simple as when I run an SNOP process in, in the plan space, am I equally concerned about having enough inventory to reach the aspirational level of revenue and to meet the demand? Or am I also concerned about the leftover inventory which might become obsolete and therefore become waste, right? When I'm doing my deliver, Am I concerned about the economic advantage of route, how I route and ship and the mode of transport that I use and the network that I establish to support that as much as I am about the carbon footprint that that network might create? So when we take a look at excellence across plan, source, make, deliver, return, we're very much focused on making sure that we do best practice in those areas while respecting the three dimensions. And that was key. In addition to that, outside of that layer of the three dimensions, then what you see is what we call our enablement layer. In our enablement layer, this is where we add in strategy, right? We add in governance. We focus on the workforce. That's a key enabler and one that's very close to the heart of ASCM, of course. Um, and then we took a look at technology and knowledge management. So when you looked at some of the other credentialings that were out there, credentials that were out there, it was really technology and knowledge management was sadly underrepresented. And we thought, of course, that that was a key one for us. The final layer on the outside of the ring here is what we call our stakeholder layer. So this is, of course, from a supply chain perspective where we add in the voice of the customer coming not only from our customer but a voice of supplier as well. So that was one thing from a Baldridge example for you took a look at that and there was no reference at all to the supplier. It was all about the customer, which is great, but of course from a supply chain perspective, we're equally concerned about the supply side. And then of course we have the stakeholder engagement from government, very important for many organizations, as well as to the community. So giving full representation to any corporate social responsibility CR, CSR kind of initiatives. So this is the structure that we put into play um, and this is how the standards are organized. So let me give you a couple of quick examples. Now, if anybody here is interested in the details, again, these are completely transparent. I will not be going through the 132 pages of standards with you. 
Um, you're all going, <laughs> thank God. Um, however, the standards are transparent. The draft is available. It is available in soft copy. And if you're interested, just leave me your business card and we'll get it emailed out to you. But I wanted to share you an example of what that looks like. So this is an example of different best practices that were leveraged from the SCORE model, or most of them from the SCORE model directly, and shows examples where best practice across multiple dimensions could exist. Right? So let me play across one of them for you, responsible sourcing for an example. So if you take a look at responsible sourcing, you see that there are many, in terms of responsible sourcing, we're going to focus on the ethical dimension. Right? So there are many standards that we pulled from multiple other places that would represent that you're ethically managing your sourcing activities. Right? So these standards that you see here are, what are standards of which a company would be evaluated against. So we'd be looking for evidence points that would represent that from a sourcing perspective, you're managing the sourcing activities in a responsible and ethical fashion. So the standards, 100% clear. In addition to that, we provide evidence points that give evidence that if you were going to show that you were meeting those standards, these are potential points in which you could show evidence that the standards are being met. So if you had things like fair, uh, codes of, fair trade code of conduct, you had some supplier scorecards, you had a policy that was set that, you, uh, that you're selecting suppliers because also they're able to demonstrate ethical, um, and that would be suppliers to suppliers, not just your first tier suppliers, because many of those potholes, as you know, um, and those who have been unfortunately uh, been a victim to having some incidences around ethical supply, oftentimes that's in tier two and in tier three. So these kind of evidence points exist as well. Again, completely transparent. Going back to the standards, however, the standards are what a company gets evaluated on. The evidence points are merely there to suggest that if you wanted to show uh, an evaluator that you're meeting the standards, these are possible evidence points that you could use for a demonstration. So that's kind of addressing, this is example around source, kind of addressing the ring that was plan, source, make, deliver, responsible, showing responsibility across the three dimensions. That being said, when we extend into uh, the full dimensional view, then we really start to take a look at things like, as you can see here, the ethical list, you see anti-corruption, codes of conduct, confidentiality of information, which has been a hot topic recently as well. Uh, you see everything from intellectual property patents, human rights, um, also from the customer side, responsible marketing and trading partner engagement. That's of course, do you represent yourself in an ethical fashion to the marketplace and do you not get a customer in a sort of not so good kind of way? Um, the ecological side, of course, focused on mo most of what you would expect. Again, then we see 3.5, we see the circular economy. You also see product lifecycle stewardship. So how do I manage ecologically the product all the way through its initial introduction, through its maturity and decline phase? Um, on the economic excellence, this was an interesting one. Um, and not the, most e not the easiest one for us to actually figure out what should be there. So if you take a look at the list that exists under the economic excellence criteria, what you'll see is these are things that if they didn't exist, could have a massive impact on the overall shareholder value. So if I had uh, some violations in business integrity, if I had some kind of risk event that occurred and not an effective crisis management, et cetera, these kinds of events we know um, can have massive shareholder impacts particularly around things like risk, but you also things like if I'm unfairly working a responsible tax regime uh, or I'm doing things like uh, not being able to, to uh, respond appropriately to, as I said, a crisis event, et cetera, all of these could have major impacts and impacts that would take um, likely months, if not years, to recover from, right? So that's the kind of dimension uh, the dimension criteria that we put into uh, the economic dimension. Um, in addition to that, then going out further from there in terms of our enablement layer, then you see things relative to overall strategy. Here we stretch a little bit from just supply chain and you'll see the first one under strategy talks about research and innovation. This was very important for us to have that inclusion because of course we know that many of the impacts that we have in supply chain are as a direct result of decisions which were taken in the design chain cycle. 
So research and innovation, of course, being an important factor for us there. Supply chain strategy, execution, our overall vision, core values, et cetera. Governance also exists, of course, that's everything from leadership all the way down, process governance. This includes things like our regulatory compliance, how we manage contracts and agreements, SLAs, and also includes our HSE functionality. On workforce, um, this, was, um, this was an interesting one, probably arguably because of the multicultural nature of our participant team, this was the one that we least coalesced around, I would say. Um, because we know that by country, workforce, and things like, if I just take the first one, diversity and inclusion from a workforce standpoint, again, is one that aspirationally, if you're a multinational, you might have set it a, at a government, or I mean, as a governance kind of layer, certainly across the enterprise. But when you got into things like country-specific activities, diversity and inclusion differed quite greatly. Um, so this was one that we really had to think about the standards and how we would set the standards or what would be compliant relative to things like diversity and inclusion. Would it be just based upon results or by specific intent, right? So these were the kinds of discussions that we had initially as well. For each of these criteria, however, what I would tell you is that for every one of those, we do a measurement on what is compliant or non-compliant. There are actually four ratings. Uh, it's very similar to ISO, for those of you who are familiar with ISO. It would be either I'm compliant, I have some room for improvement, I have a minor violation in compliance, or I have a major violation in compliance. And those are the free, those are the four uh, scoring criteria that we use. Okay. Of course, the idea behind that as well is that if you had a minor compliance factor, that you thought could be resolved or we thought mutually could be resolved, we would provide any participant in the registration process the opportunity to resolve that violation if possible. Lastly, we had technology and knowledge management as a part of that list as well. So the one thing, of course, when you're setting criteria is that you're trying to set criteria that's strong enough that you feel like the achievement of receiving the certification has been valuable enough but not so strong that there wouldn't be anybody who could actually achieve it, right? So a lot of the discussions in the last six months have been around how do you set that at the appropriate level? What passes the reasonable test? We did a workshop in Chicago two weeks ago. We put our first set of examiners. We put the ASM staff, the committee who reviews the evaluation recommendation all together in a room for five days. Um, and then reviewed every set of criteria against uh, every set of measurement against every criteria that you see here, just to make sure it passed it the reasonable test. And again, that's where you have a lot of discussions about what level of violation is allowable or not allowable. Okay. So that's, uh, that's in essence how the model comes together in terms of the criteria itself. Again, this is completely transparent. Um, approximately the standards break down like this. So the center ring across the three dimensions and across the plan source make deliver return elements and their subsequent results represents about 60% of the standards undergoing evaluation. About 40% sit in the enablement and stakeholder layer. Okay. Which was the goal that we set out originally and funny enough, our standards and the way they worked out pretty much represented that, right? So pretty much holds true to that designation criteria. Um, again, quite new, but I'll explain a little bit on how the process works in case you or as your organization might be interested um, or you may be talking to somebody who would be interested. Again, very much similar and modeled after an ISO process. So a company decides they'd like to pursue the certification. Couple of things before that. There is an online, already available, survey that you can take that would give you the first self-assessment as to your maturity levels across this set of criteria, which you could use to judge for yourself whether even going for a registration process looks like a worthwhile activity. That's number one. In addition to that, and we did this for many of our pilot companies, we can also have a facilitated two-day readiness check. This is where we go through the standards with you and we review the standards and the evidence points you have against the standards, again, giving you some kind of indication as to whether or not you think it's worthwhile to do the registration. 
either of those are optional events. If you decide to do the registration, you go through a registration process. Quite simply, what happens is, of course, you pay something um, for the registration process itself. And then we do, in essence, a submission of documentation. There are about 30 documents, which basically represent the higher level evidence points. And those documents are provided so that an evaluator can do what we call a desktop review. So we're looking for already evidence that you've met the criteria through the, that we're already looking for the evidence that says you've met the standards, right? Because obviously what you want to do in any live evaluation is you want to limit those two things, the gaps that you might find, or that you want to dig deeper into some key evidence points, et cetera, as a result of that. So once the registration is done, there is a desktop review, and then we formulate a project scoping in terms of the evaluation. So that scoping plan would say, here's some processes we want to look at in more detail, here's some people we want to meet with, here's some more additional documentation we might be looking for, et cetera. And that's a tri-party conversation between ASCM, of course, the evaluator, who is not an ASCM employee, those are independent third-party evaluators, and in addition to that, the client themselves that's undergoing the registration. So that project scoping, that discussion, and basically setting forth the evaluation plan is a three-party discussion. Once that discussion takes place, then we start basically closing any additional gaps. It should be very clear from an evaluator's standpoint, if they're going on site to do evaluation, what are you looking for? An evaluator is not there to try, try to, to surprise you on things, right? Of course, they might have some questions that you hadn't anticipated as a result of the discussions which are taking place. But if there are any evaluation priorities, we're going to try to set those forth as a part of the evaluation plan going forward, and also so that the client can prepare and, of course, that you can not waste each other's time. So there's that and any additional information, closures that information, et cetera. Then there's an on-site evaluation, of course, which takes place. In many instances, the project scoping would be, let's say, use an example, uh, and we benchmark this, this approach with ISO and others. So let's say, for example, in your supply chain network undergoing the evaluation, you might have 50 physical sites as a part of the network. It's not likely that an evaluator will want to visit 50 sites. A lot of the processes are the same in multiple sites. There may be a lot of processes which are governed from a headquarter facility, et cetera. I'd say in all likelihood, say if you had 50 sites in your overall network, it wouldn't be unusual that 15 site visits might take place or something less than that, right? In addition to that, of course, it is a three-year certification. So there's an annual maintenance as a part of the project scoping. In the annual maintenance, you may decide that additional site visits are necessary, and those are planned out uh, in advance as a part of the annual maintenance. So when an evaluator arrives at the site, does a review, makes their recommendation, does the scoring, writes the report, et cetera, that report then gets submitted back to ASCM, which has an independent, has developed a working committee. That working committee is the recipient of the evaluator's recommendation as to whether or not the company or that company's supply chain should be certified. That committee looks to be sure the evaluator has done the right job in terms of the assessment against the criteria. Once that is done, the committee comes back and says, yes, we agree or disagree with the recommendation. If they agree with the recommendation, then they award the recommendation certification to the company, again, against the three-year annual plan. The idea is that as a part of the project scoping, the companies themselves could choose what they want to scope relative to this evaluation, right, relative to the certification. So it isn't necessary, for example, that it has to be enterprise-wide. In most cases, for example, we're not going to go certify all of Boeing's operations worldwide with 140,000 employees in the first go-round, right? It could be by business unit. It could be by supply chain. It could be by a collective set of products. It might even be by certain processes, right? In fact, the first evaluation which will take place at the end of July will be with, with Petrobras. Um, and in that instance, it's actually taking a look at a subset of processes as opposed to an entire supply chain. So they're actually looking to get certified on the, both their source, uh, their source and a little bit of their deliver process as well. So a company receives the certification based upon the scoping, which is agreed, and the certification is awarded against the scope, which was agreed, right? So just because you got the certification doesn't mean that you get the certification for everything worldwide. You get the certification, and those details will be maintained by ASCM and made transparent to the entire community on ASCM's website. Okay. So where are we now? 
We are finally finished with setting the standards as of two weeks ago. That draft is what I said is available to you in soft copy. If you'd like it, you'd be the first in the world to receive it. We just finished it last week. Um, we are, just did the first set of training on examiners two weeks ago. The first, uh, some multiple pilot companies are still undergoing the readiness check. Three have already undergone a readiness check. And the first company to go for registration will be at the end of July. Then we move into full scale. So my, uh, my guesstimate is by third quarter of this year, um, we'll have probably a very significant pipeline of companies that are willing and, and wanting to undergo um, the certification. We are in the process of commercializing that. The commercialized launch is actually the 18th of June. Um, in addition to that, we're setting up pricing and happy to talk to you about that, but we are definitely considering some very discounted <laughs> related pricing for government and for NGO organizations. If you want any further information, please leave me your business card or I'll talk to you afterwards. Or my colleague Grant is here, you can talk to him as well. He was part of that team. Um, we can try to answer any questions for you. Thank you very much. Nice.